Awesome. Well, thank you for giving, the, giving me the opportunity to talk about our paper that just came out a, a few months ago. Um, and so um, my name is Chris. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Nevada, Reno, uh, with my advisor, uh, uh, Dr. Matt Forrester, who's also uh, in this, uh, uh, in this uh, webinar uh, part of, and, and, and will be part of the panel later. Um, I'm just going to be kind of sharing about our recent work where we look for pesticides in milkweed sold in nurseries. And um, before I dive right into like the specifics of this study and what we found, I wanted to give some of the broad motivations because this was very much inspired by some of our previous work that came out a couple years ago. So I just wanted to kind of briefly touch on that before um, diving right into the results. Now, starting as broad as I could possibly think to start, um, let's see. Um, and we know that it's been uh, both much talked about in the popular media, but also in the scientific literature that insects are facing a wide range of threats across, across the world. And this has led to, you know, um, uh, in some cases, massively observed declines. Um, not always, um, depends. There's, there's definitely a lot of nuance and context there, but um, we, we have seen observed declines across the world. And one of these threats um, appears to be the, um, the, or the use of pesticides. Um, and we also know that at least regionally, this could be important in the US. This is a paper put out by, uh, by, by Matt Forrester, where we, where Matt looked at these, um, you look, looked at the increasing use of neonicotinoids, in this case in the Sacramento Valley. And kind of what made this study especially powerful is it's aided by a really, really detailed long-term time series of data where butterflies have been observed in this area um, by a world expert for in now up to 50 years. And over the first kind of 25 years of this study, there's this uh, where, where in this figure, we're looking at just the number of species seen per year over time. Uh, we kind of just saw this steady, this um, overall kind of a steady trend. And then as neonics started to be introduced in the Sacramento Valley in the mid nineties, um, we start to see declines. Um, and so that was a paper that was out there. And then um, there became more news about, uh, uh, especially in the past few years about the uh, declines of monarchs, especially in the Western US, which then kind of naturally led to a follow-up question. And I know there's a lot on this slide. I'm not expecting anybody to just dive in and figure out what all it's, what, what, um, all, what it means. Uh, but we wanted to search for pesticides in milkweeds that were found throughout kind of the Northern Central Valley. So this included milkweeds on, on the roadside in near ag farms, in refuges, some case in, in urban environments, and also in um, some specific cases in, uh, in some retail um, um, nurseries. Um, and we found kind of pesticides everywhere that we looked. Um, and this figure on the right is this heat map where, um, where we have um, the, uh, compound on the y-axis and then a site is on the x-axis and if it's white it means it wasn't found and then there's an increasing level of intensity where deep purple and black we uh, we found it in high concentration and i'm going to kind of reproject this figure in a different way turn it on its side um and one kind of important thing was a white dot indicates that it's we detected that pesticide at uh, above a concentration shown to have lethal effects. In this case, it was an LD50. So on average, that particular, uh, wherever it was, that roadside, that, that nursery, um, the milkweed there had a perhaps a lethal concentration of that pesticide. Um, and this was kind of just, first of all, it was surprising in general. Um, but one thing that really stood out to us were these two samples um, that we, we went to two different nurseries in this one area. And they were, um, uh, perhaps they were among the most contaminated samples that we had, which kind of led naturally to this follow-up question is, is this, is just specific to this one area? Did we happen to sample at a particularly bad time of the year? You can think of a lot of reasons why this could or could not be a broad phenomenon. So we really wanted to expand on this. Um, so that led to this question um, as kind of just how wide scale uh, is this? And are these pesticides detectable in nurseries? Oh yeah, and yeah, how wide is this? So what we did, and by we, I mean the uh, Xerces Society organized a, um, a uh, yeah, led an, uh, organized an effort to purchase milkweeds from nurseries uh, throughout the country. We actually obtained um, uh, samples from 33 different stores, which contained uh, five different species. 
if we could, we tried to get more than one species per store, but most of the time it was one store, one species of milkweed. Um, and the retailers varied in size. So we're talking about nurseries that are single locations to multinational like corporation type um, uh, stores. And we had five plants per store per species and then five grams of plant uh, of, of, of leaves. So we're really only looking at leaves in this study from the perspective of say a monarch caterpillar, not nectar. Um, and then these leaves were sent um, oh, and then, sorry, here's a bit of the, um, this is where we looked, so uh, 33 stores, um, a decent distribution throughout, th throughout the country and where we can expect monarchs to perhaps be. Um, and we sent these samples to the Cornell Chemical Ecology Corps facility, who then took these to sample um, or to screen them for 92 pesticides. Um, and it's important that it's 92 pesticides, there's many more that just by the nature of the analysis that's done, we, we, we couldn't look for this time. Um, so we, um, but this, this does make up many of the same pesticides we looked for in that previous study. Um, and so first, um, this is just a kind of a broad view. It's a really similar figure to what I showed before um, is out of those 92, we found 61 of those pesticides. Um, and here they are broken into on the x-axis we have compounds and you can see they're broadly broken up to insecticides fungicides and herbicides um, and then on the y-axis here we have the location and it's organized by state um, and on where in the previous figure um, a white dot indicated uh, it was above a lethal concentration a known lethal concentration from like the from a um, published stu uh, study uh, in this case i guess um, one of um, what's going to be, I think, overall quarter, sort of a downer of a talk. Um, one, I guess, one positive thing is we actually didn't detect anything at those concentrations we saw previously from like ag margins. There's nothing above a published lethal concentration. But these white dots do indicate um, that at, at that specific store, this compound was found above a known sublethal concentration or, or a concentration that's known to have some physiological impact on a monarch butterfly. And I'm going to dive more into what that actually is later or, or, or what that effect is. Um, and also, again, we have where um, a box that's white means it wasn't detected and then going up on a log scale to where uh, you, these purple colors are, are can be incredibly high concentrations. Um, so I'm um, thinking about kind of the, and, and, or, and so we got these results and we wanted to explore what, if there's any level of predictability of can we understand uh, where more or less uh, pesticides are being found? Um, and so we first looked at the, the retailer size or the number of stores of that, in, yeah, of that retailer. Um, and we saw slightly more compounds being used by larger retailers, but it's important to note, um, while this is a quote significant result, it's on average about 0.5 more pesticides. So um, this might be one of those cases where that's not actually from the perspective of a caterpillar, that might not be much of a difference. It's, it's, it's not a huge difference. Um, we also looked by species and didn't find any strong differences. Um, we looked in region, so we split by the Eastern and Western US um, and no differences. And then the final um, uh, variable that we looked at and I wanna point out, so it's gonna come back is we wanted to look at whether or not the plant, when it was being uh, uh, sold, if it had some sort of label indicating whether it was quote or not quote, but beneficial for plants or in some way it was trying to um, say um, as benefit or sorry, beneficial for pollinators, beneficial in some way, just as like a selling point for the consumer to have some confidence that um, it should be maybe um, less contaminated. Um, and so there's pretty much every store told said this in a different way. So it's not a specific label, just whether or not they were giving some indication of they should be better. Um, and in that case, actually samples that had labels had uh, slightly more compounds, but it was again, kind of the situation where I don't, it's probably not actually that meaningful. So it's a, it's a pretty small difference. Um, we also wanna look at diversity of compounds. So you can imagine a case where a plant has 10 compounds, but only two are found in very high concentrations. So in reality, it has more like two compounds. That's what we're trying to look at here. Um, and this, these results are very much similar to just the number of compounds where we don't see large differences between these, these predictor variables. Um, but one, um, one thing we also wanted to look at was, it's not just 
the number of compounds in diversity because that treats the concentrations of compounds like they're the same, but you can imagine two compounds where one, they both have concentrations of 10, but 10 in one of those compounds means a lot different than 10 in the other one. Um, the concentrations that compounds can have effect are, uh, can be quite different. Um, and, so, and, and so we really wanted to think about realized outcomes for caterpillars. And so to do this, we actually went through the literature of the found, found the few studies that have tested the compounds we detected directly on monarch caterpillars in a controlled setting to get some idea of the impacts these can have. And then we quantified the number of exceedances. So the number of times we detected a, a sample that exceeded a published concentration that can have an effect, if, uh, if that makes sense. And so in this case, uh, when working at the number of exceedances, in this case, the y-axis is the uh, percentage of the samples that, um, that had an exceedance. And so we didn't see large differences between reta retailer sizes again. Um, we did see a small effect, um, particular um, Asclepius um, fascicularis had slightly uh, less exceedances, but there's only two samples here. So I don't think we can be very confident in that result. Um, we didn't see regional uh, differences. Um, the largest difference we saw was um, was that plants that had a label, again, indicating they're beneficial to pollinators in some vague way. Um, actually, if anything, they, were no, they, they weren't different or from no um, labels. And if anything, they actually on average contained more um, exceedances than things without labels. This is kind of intriguing. So we wanted to dig into this a little further and find out what compounds are most associated with that. Um, and so we ran this, we ran an, analysis and found that samples that are uh, labeled um, as beneficial are more likely to have things like uh, uh, tri 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 trifloxytrobin and azoxytrobin. I am apologized to people who know pesticide names very well. I butcher these continuously and I'm sure I said both of those wrong. Um, but you can see here that both of those were uh, found much more uh, frequently in um, uh, samples that are labeled with some sort of beneficialness than, um, than without that label. Um, and both of these, I should point out, are fungicides. Um, and so, uh, yeah. Um, and in general, fungicides were more ubiquitous in our samples than insecticides. Um, and I wanted to point out the study that actually had where we got those um, exceedances from, because um, it really was critical to our work and it was quite important. Um, and it was uh, this study that came out a few years ago. Um, and they looked at many of the compounds we actually uh, found, um, in, uh, including both azoxytrobin and tri trifloxytrobin. Um, and they didn't find uh, differences in survival, uh, but there were differences, um, both of uh, compounds that were exposed to both of those compounds um, at a larval stage um, had reduced wing length as adults, um, which perhaps might be especially important for something like a monarch, um, which has to migrate uh, very long distances. Um, and I wanted to um, end here with just our, my last slide about kind of what we're, what we found. I apologize for having so much text on this slide, um, but some of them, some of the things we um, were kind of um, yeah, some of the implications of this work. And one is that we found 61 out of the 92 compounds, which is almost, I think about two thirds, which is quite high actually, I was surprised. Um, and 12.2 compounds for plants, uh, per, per plant on, on average, um, which does lead to the strong possibility for synergism between compounds. Um, it's one thing to have, um, if you're a caterpillar, you're, you're eating a leaf with one or two compounds, but 12, um, some of which might be a synergist compound that's specifically designed to interact with other um, pesticides. Um, and we really don't know much about that. Um, synergism seems to be very context dependent, both on the compounds present and their concentrations. And so it's very difficult to predict how those things might work together. Um, we also don't know, and this is potentially a, uh, we, and this is potentially on one of the positive side is we don't know much about the dissipation of compounds over time, which is say pesticides that are put on a plant do not remain on the plant for in, indefinitely. Um, and both this and synergism are, are areas that we really could use more research and how these things impact 
monarchs, but also just other insects and um, and and um, in general. Because um, as I highlight here, we have we and we know little about we know very little about the impacts of pesticides on monarchs. Out of the 61 that we found, I think only nine had ever been experimentally tested on monarchs. And we probably know more about the impacts of these on monarchs than any other butterfly. And then butterflies are clinically overstudied compared to things like um, pretty much anything else besides bees. So there's a lot more out there besides monarchs and there's a lot more out there besides butterflies and bees. Um, and so findings like this are potentially, um, um, are, could potentially have wide impacts. Um, despite many things not eating milkweed, um, you know, um, the, 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 whatever's happening upstream to that, that, uh, that's resulting in this could potentially uh, be on other plants as well. So, um, and with that, I wanna acknowledge the uh, co-authors in the paper and also um, Sharon, who's been super helpful with both um, organizing this and just giving us awesome feedback, acknowledge uh, funding sources, um, and then these are the two papers that I referenced, and I think we're going to put a link somewhere to both these papers. They're both open access, so anybody can find them and read them for yourselves. Um, so thank you. And I'm going to think just turn this directly over to Sharon. Okay, everyone. I uh, hello. I'm Sharon Salvaggio. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can, Sharon. Okay. And okay. Well, um, is it looking good, Rachel? Yes, it looks great. Looks great. Okay, great. So, uh, thanks, Chris. That was really great to get that overview of the data and what we found. And uh, we know that this information is concerning. Uh, many of you in the audience are gardeners who've been working on monarch conservation for a long time. Others of you may manage public parks or campuses or do restoration. And we know that this information is concerning, but so what I'm going to talk about is how you can help as we work together to reduce pesticide impact um, to monarchs and other important insects um, from plants that we buy in nurseries. So I love this photo and I hope you do too. Uh, these are milkweed pods. And just as these milkweed pods stand shoulder to shoulder, we believe um, that there are solutions if we work on these things together. It's really about addressing root causes. Milkweed isn't the problem, it's chemical dependent uh, pest management that really is the problem here. So pollinator gardens represent a concrete achievable method for slowing or re reversing pollinator declines. So please don't stop planting milkweed, don't stop planting other pollinator plants. Instead, consider the root causes and try to address those. So what are those root causes? Um, on nursery plants, we, we believe that it comes from several causes, that there's an intolerance of plant damage or the presence of insects, and this really comes from us, I hate to say, but we don't like to see bugs on the plants that we buy. Uh, we expect them to be perfect. So that's something that I think we all need to think about. There are also state and federal plant health regulations that have been put in place to prevent uh, economically damaging or invasive insects or diseases or weeds uh, from crossing state boundaries. These can also result in pesticide use um, at the nurseries so that nurseries can get their plants shipped, uh, shipped out. We also know that for some pesticides, nurseries can use much higher rates per plant than what is allowed in food crops. Um, this is maybe something that comes from, you know, the food, food safety regulations that are in place in the United States, but because we don't have similar safety regulations for bees that sort of cap the amount of pesticide per plant, um, it, it, it may result in some of these high residues. Um, there's also a lack of awareness among, um, uh, you know, the broad public, among nursery growers, retailers, people who buy plants, and it's not easy to dialogue about 
these issues if you're buying plants. You know, you, you need to know a few things, you need to know how to ask about these, um, et cetera. And finally, there's no labeling rules in place about these. So these are some of the root causes uh, that we believe we need to address ultimately. So as a consumer, uh, you have purchasing power that actually can transform practices. We know this from the success of the campaign that started almost 10 years ago to ask nurseries to not use neonicotinoid insecticides on nursery plants. That uh, didn't eliminate neonic use on nursery plants, but it did diminish um, the amount of neonics that we used. Um, so whether you're a home gardener buying one or two plants or a landscape designer who buys thousands of plants every year or a city who may contract for plants to be delivered in several years, you all have consumer purchasing power. And whatever you size, talking to your nursery is the place to start. Make clear to your nursery that you want pollinator safe plants, plants free of pesticides that could be harmful to bees, monarchs and other pollinators. And if you've got a designer or an installer working for you, talk to them um, and be willing to plan further ahead, change the way you buy to think a little bit ahead. Now, when you talk to your nurseries, making this statement once, say going in in summer of 2023 and, and talking to one person is not as impactful as saying it every single time that you go into the nursery. And so the more nursery managers hear this, the more they'll pay attention. Oops, went up instead of down. And don't stop there. Um, don't stop with telling them what you want. Interpret what pollinator safe means so that they, they know what you mean. Um, first, you can ask if they have organic plants and seeds. And you, or you can ask them to guide you to the organic uh, plants and seeds. Now we know that beyond vegetables, these are difficult to find for ornamental plants, for pollinator plants. Some people are producing this way though. If they can't offer you organics, ask them if they have plants that have been grown without neonicotinoids and other similar systemic insecticides, several of which we found in this study at relatively high levels. Um, growers that have adopted neonic free policies are showing that they want to do the right thing. Um, and that's great. But we also see that there's been product substitution. And so we don't think neonic free is enough anymore. So we also ask that you ask what steps your nursery takes to offer plants grown with pollinator friendly pest management. And this goes deeper, it goes into how they actually produce the plants and whether they're trying to reduce their pesticide reliance by using really responsible pest management methods. This postcard shown here uh, is something that we've produced uh, so that you can take this, share it with your friends and family, your community. And um, if you'd like some copies of these, please contact us at pesticides at xerces.org. Uh, Rachel, if you don't mind putting that in the chat, that will give everybody our email address. And finally, although we use the phrase on this postcard, be safe, this guidance can also help you find plants that are safe for monarchs and other butterflies. As you talk to your nurseries, um, be friendly. Um, not putting people, avoiding putting people on the defensive really pays dividends. Remember, you know, your questions may take nursery staff by surprise. And many nursery staff may not know how to respond to your questions. They may be temporary employees who uh, have only been there for a few months or haven't been trained enough to really respond. So uh, keep it friendly, familiarize yourself with the nursery. And if the person that you're talking to cannot answer, ask to speak to someone who can, or let them know that you would like to check back after they've had time to gather more information. Now, We've been giving this guidance out for about a year and a half, and we have heard from many of you um, that these conversations can be frustrating uh, since retail nursery staff in particular don't always have the answers. We encourage you to stick with this, even though it's hard and frustrating, because part of what you're doing is raising awareness and creating that consumer demand. So um, please keep that in mind and keep doing this. And finally, whenever possible, leverage your power. So this can mean organizing other people to go 
all on a particular weekend or to come with you or whenever they visit that nursery. Or if you're a large buyer, such as a landscape designer, an installer, an architect, a city, a retailer, consider a contract grow with specifications uh, on pesticides and pest management. So let's talk a little bit more for those who buy plants for a living. Those of you in the audience, such as retailers, landscape designers, installers, you too can have these conversations. Xerces recommends that you as a professional go deeper with your suppliers. Um, you probably know them pretty well. And in the fact sheet shown here, offering Be Safe Plants, a guide for nurseries, we suggest a number of questions that you can use to better understand the growing practices of each grower that you buy from. Um, I'll have Rachel put this in the chat as well as another uh, fact sheet that we have that I'll talk about in just a minute. So getting a sense of how pollinators safe the practices are of the nurseries that you source from, um, when how the pollinators safe the pest management methods are, this will give you peace of mind and it will also give you information that you can pass on to your consumers, your buyers, your customers. And this will help you identify and favor those who are implementing the most solid and protective pest management programs. Just gonna go into a little bit of, of what that might look like. Um, so an important question, probably the number one question for your suppliers is asking how they prevent problem insects and diseases. We know that there are lots of problem insects and diseases that are associated with nursery production. People talk about white flies, aphids, fungus gnats, et cetera, thrips. So nearly every grower practices some sort of pest prevention. And if you think about um, how they're responding to you, we ask you to think about these things. Are they using multiple tactics? Really, will one single prevention tactic work on its own? This is a concept better known as many little hammers rather than the big hammer of a pesticide. If you're using preventative methods, often you'd use many tactics. Is there a purpose behind the prevention method? Um, or are they just throwing things at the wall? Um, the technique should demonstrate a clear link to either plant health or pest suppression. The prevention tactics should also be informed by science. Luckily, Extension does a lot of this, um, and so you can ask about that. And finally, and most critically, these non-chemical prevention methods should be considered first and always before pesticides are used. Um, because prevention methods deal with the root causes when a pesticide just knocks down the pest. Also, we think it's important that you ask your suppliers about how they assess pest pressure before applying pesticides. Do they have a good scouting and monitoring program? And some indicators of that is that the monitoring would be regularly scheduled, sometimes weekly using an established systematic protocol. This helps nurseries to have established procedures that are followed by every staff member doing this. And it makes results comparable from week to week, giving a more reliable estimate of pressure. Keeping written records is really important. Without written records, a nursery would have to rely on someone with a very good memory to track changes over time. And, um, and assess the effectiveness of whatever intervention they chose. So written records are really important. Um, and monitoring and scouting is not uh, a beginner task. It is something that requires quite a lot of skill. So um, this is something that uh, nurseries, they should be using trained scouts, um, using diagnostic labs if they can't identify, particularly diseases are helpful with diagnostic labs. Um, so making sure that they actually know what they're looking for and how to identify it in the different life stages that might be present. And also nurseries that are also looking for beneficials, uh, because oftentimes there will be beneficials either deliberately used or that have come into the nursery that are already working on the problem. And pesticides can knock those back. So nurseries that know how to identify those, um, uh, that, you know, that's an important part of a scouting program. And finally, the results should drive the intervention decisions. Scouting should be used to determine whether and what kind of intervention is actually needed. 
And all of this will help keep pesticide treatments to a lower level in the nursery. We also um, recommend that, especially those larger bios, but also home bios, use this list of uh, neonicotinoid and similar insecticides to, to ask if they're using any of these. We know these are hard to pronounce, clothianidin, dinotafuron, imidacloprid, thiamethoxam, clopyridifuron, cyanotinolipril. I rattled them off just to kind of let you know they are pronounceable, but it doesn't matter. If you can't pronounce them, you can show them the list. It's in our fact sheet. And um, honestly, this isn't just about insecticides because as Chris just described, um, we also see concern with the use of fungicides. And so using the prevention and monitoring for diseases um, is also important because fungicides can also lead to harm. Whoops, again, I hit the wrong button, sorry. Okay, and the last thing to check into is if they do use pesticides, how do they limit that harm? When do they apply? Do they avoid routine pesticide applications? We also want to know that there's no bloom time spray, especially of insecticides, and that they would avoid insecticides at least four weeks prior to sale. How do they apply? Do they use broadcast spray spreading it all across the nursery, or do they just treat the affected plants that have a problem? Do they mix pesticides together? Those are known as tank mixes, or are they avoiding those? We, we, we know that because pesticides can interact, avoiding tank, tank mixes is really important. And the more that targeted pesticide application rather than broadcast can be used, the better. So I, I wanna mention a couple of resources. We have a new tool at our website, which can help you find native plant suppliers um, and, and their self-reported information about their pesticide use. Um, this can be a valuable first cut as you look for suppliers. So there we go. You can see um, if you go to this website and Rachel, I think I've got a link um, that I sent to you that you could put in the chat. Um, you can filter on a number of different kinds of um, parameters, including location, um, percent native species, the pesticide use, et cetera. This is a valuable tool. It's a new tool. We have, I think a few hundred um, native plant seed and services, service businesses listed at this point. We hope it grows over time and we hope it's useful to you as you, as you look for plants. Another resource that you may find useful is our milkweed finder. Rachel, could you also post the link for both of these resources? Um, if you're looking for milkweed rhizomes, seeds, plants, um, the milkweed finder will be useful to you. And more generally at our website, the Pollinator Conservation Resource Center is an excellent resource um, for those looking to create habitat. Whoops, I keep hitting the wrong button, I apologize. <laughs> Um, a purchasing policy is a proactive way to integrate pollinator safety into your purchases. Um, and this is especially useful if you're a retailer, if you are a, a large buyer, such as a landscape designer, a broker, uh, a, if you're a landscape architect or a city that specifies purchases. If you work with organizations under grow contracts, you'll be able to specify in advance exactly what you want and what you don't want. And at, for retailers, um, there are retailers such as Garden Fever in Portland, Oregon, who were early leaders in pollinator safety purchasing policies by checking with their suppliers. For example, Garden Fever checked with all of their suppliers and about their neonicotinoid usage, and they designated retail space for plants from neonic free nurseries. Xerces, as an organization ourselves, we do um, a lot of restoration work and we provide plants to other people. Uh, that means that we think about these screens with our own purchases. And our contract growers have eliminated a number of harmful pesticides already. And we're continuing to work on our contract specifications and we'll be ready to share those probably by next spring. So as large buyers, retailers, cities, designers, restoration organizations, 
adopt such purchasing policies, we think the supply will be more pollinator safe for everyone. So to learn more, um, these are two fact sheets. One of them I already introduced. Um, Rachel, if you haven't already, if you could put the link to the buying bee safe plants in the chat. Um, you can use these to remind yourself of um, the things that I've said here today. Whether you're a home gardener or a large, large buyer, these should be useful to you. And um, we're also organizing a day of action, October 26. This is essentially a collective uh, virtual, in a way, um, day, uh, just to know that there's other people out there just like you on this day um, who will be visiting their nurseries uh, across the country to ask for pollinator safe plants. We'll start it out with a brief, um, probably a 10 to 15 minute just review of some of this stuff. We hope you can join us. Um, we have a link if you want to be part of this. And Rachel, if you could put that also in the chat, I think that's the last link that I'm sharing. Um, you may think October, I never buy plants in October, but in talking with nurseries, we've realized that they are so busy in spring and summer that fall is actually a much better time to have these kinds of conversations. And they also tend to order plants in the fall. So you may actually have more leverage and more influence if you go talk to your nurseries in the fall or even the winter. Um, so we really hope you can join us for that. Um, these fact sheets are available at our website and Rachel's sharing them with you. If you need multiple copies because you might be working with uh, a larger group in your community, please feel free to contact me at that, at that um, email that we gave you earlier. Uh, we just had a fire in our office, so we're a little bit um, restricted on how we can access that right now. So uh, we can send these to you. It might not arrive immediately. Uh, we'll do the best that we can. But if you do need larger quantities, please contact me. Finally, just briefly, and, and we hope to um, maybe in another session, another webinar, talk about these in more detail. Um, but we, you know, as you've noticed, we promote voluntary actions to help make the world a better and safer place for pollinators. But that said, sometimes uh, market and regulatory solutions are able to respond to larger systems level issues. And for, so for the purpose of stimulating thinking, I'm listing out a few of these here. For example, deploying voluntary certification programs that verify pollinator safe growing, such as our Be Better Certified program that Xerces has for farms. Uh, we don't yet have this for nurseries, but this is a potential option on the horizon. Um, there are also options to incentivize pollinator safe nursery growing practices uh, through the Farm Bill. The Natural Resources Conservation Service already incentivizes all kinds of um, environmentally friendly farming practices, and this can potentially be done through their programs. Uh, it may be time to establish a federal standard for some terms used on nursery labels, such as you know, these are just a couple of examples, pollinator safe, pollinator attractive. Right now, uh, there's no standard for um, the use of these terms. And as we, we saw, it didn't necessarily indicate that the plants were actually safer. Um, and I'm not just referring to these terms because there are others that are in use. Another possibility is through EPA, reducing the rates of pesticides that are allowed on nursery plants. Um, this is already done, as I mentioned, for food food crops uh, through something called a tolerance. It's a maximum residue level. Maybe we need those for pollinators. And finally, maybe there's an opportunity here to, oh, oops, I'm sorry, reform um, federal and state plant health regulations. These are really important regulations that we need for um, reducing the spread of invasives, but it's possible that there could be you know, some look at these so that we can help avoid too much pesticide use on nursery plants. Again, we welcome the opportunity to discuss these at some future point. I wanna say thanks to all of you for being here today, to Chris and Matt and Ame for being the lead authors on this study, to Stephanie who's here with us today, Stephanie Frischi, who's our native plant specialist at Xerces, and also especially to all of our supporters, um, 
who um, are listed here. I know it's really fine print and hard to read. And uh, we ask you to help spread the word about pollinator conservation and pollinator safety. We are a nonprofit. We're donor supported, as you saw in the previous slide, not just through foundations and lar larger organizations, but also through small members. So um, if you like what we, you, what we do, you can donate today to become a ZOCES member at that link. We are, I think, a four-star charity under the Charity Navigator even. So thanks everybody. All right, thank you all so much. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Chris. Um, I started off, I answered a bunch of questions in the, in the Q&A, but a couple of them I'd love to have us answer as a group, and then there's a bunch of others as well. As Sharon mentioned, we and Chris, we are joined with Matt Forster of University of Nevada, Reno. He is a noted butterfly specialist and has been part of a number of studies, both looking at correlation of declines in butterflies to an pesticide risk, as well as working with us in the studies that we are, that Chris talked about today. Stephanie Frischi is also with us. Stephanie Frischi works at Xerces with Sharon and I. Uh, she is a project lead on a lot of our milkweed work. She works with farmers to establish habitat. She's going to be a great resource for the many questions that people have related to milkweed health and other um, aspects. So we wanted to bring her in as well. Um, so Rachel, I, since I answered a couple over text, I want, I'll just bring this out and then we can talk about the other ones. So there were two questions that came up that we get a lot that I think I wanted everyone to be able to hear. One was what Chris touched on the, the real lack of data that we have on pesticide risk to monarch, right? He showed you how some of the detections that we found on these plants were at levels that could cause sublethal harm. And they were fungicides that were linked with that. But as he pointed out, we only have toxicological endpoints. So what's tox toxicologically relevant? What amount of a chemical could be harm for nine of the 61 pesticides that we found? So 15%. And um, there were other questions about systemic insecticides and trade-offs. I wanna quickly point out one of the chemicals that we found, we found at levels extremely high like over 2000 parts per billion when related chemicals can be toxic to Monarch at two parts per billion. But we don't have tox data on this chemical. Cyantronilipol is the specific chemical. Was it at a lethal level? Was it a sublethal level? We don't know for certain, but it was extremely concerning. So that's just one thing I wanted to point out. Um, the other question was back to the question of like, is this a pollinator attractive plant and you know and whether the and touching on how do we have labels that are that are stronger and i think sharon in many ways answered the question of how do we reconcile what could be pollinator attractive or valuable to wildlife yet still have pesticide concerns on it but i don't know sharon if you want to repeat that because it was up in the chat hope you're on you're muted though Hi, I, I may, get, I'm sorry, can you just repeat that question for me? Yeah, so I knew I wasn't very clear, sorry. Okay. About that. So um, the there was a question of like, how can it be that something that would be wildlife valuable or pollinator attractive, how can it be that it then is not safe? Uh, so, and I answered it in the chat and I'm, I, if- oh. you know, yeah, when we we're using this term safety as sort of a stand in for does it contain toxic pesticide residues that again, that's not a, like a, a legal term. In fact, anyway, I'll just keep it at that. That's kind of what we mean by be safe with pollinator safe free of residues of pesticides that would be um, toxic. Yeah, so there's not any regulatory way of knowing. And I think the, also that just because something says it's valuable to wildlife, that has no bearing on pesticide use on that plant. It's, it's saying that that is a plant that, you know, is somehow that maybe it's pollinator attractive or it's a host plant for butterflies. So the caterpillar would eat, would eat that, the leaves of that plant or a lot of bees are gonna be, you know, are gonna, or butterflies are gonna nectar, or bees are gonna forage on that plant. That's what it's saying. It does not have any bearing on whether, how pesticides were used on the plant. 
There's no regulation that would restrict at this time. It, it could be that that, well, it does have a policy and it, and it may in fact be, but right now there's no regulation that governs the use of those terms. Rachel, should you and I tag team? I did, we didn't clarify this. Um, reading through off the questions. Let's see where we go. Yeah, there's one for Stephanie um, from Kathy. Is it true that if your milkweed plant has aphids, it's proof that it hasn't been treated with pesticides? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, I kind of wanted to, to take that and then also open it up to someone from the pesticide team to answer this. I wouldn't say that you could absolutely be assured that it's pesticide free if aphids are feeding on it, but but it is a good indicator. Um, it, you know, those are our sap feeders, they're, they're phloem feeders. So it's really dependent upon what insecticides or other pesticides may or may not be on the plant in terms of how aphids would be affected, um, as well as how long the aphids have been there and, and how long ago it was that the plant was treated. So I know that's kind of a, a vague answer. I don't know if anyone else has anything to add. I think that's how I would have answered it. I mean, you know, we pointed out there's these fungicides, there's these sublethal effects. It's hard to know. Not all of the effects that are out there are observable or really noticeable. So there, it doesn't mean that it's pesticide free, but as Stephanie said, it's a good indicator. If your insects aren't dying on that plant, then it is interacting and adding value for that particular insect, so hopefully. It is a nice point and it's something we could think about in the future when we think about experiments, right? With different combinations of pesticides. If we had sort of naturally occurring aphids as a sort of free bioassay and think about how much that means, it would be kind of great. I'd never thought about that, but I like it. Says the deep researcher, I love it. <laughs> Evelyn has an interesting question. Um, does the size of the plant affect the butterflies? For instance, if you buy a four inch pot and the plant grows to three feet and one foot across, are there lethal residue? How much lethal residue might they expect? There's a bunch of us who could answer that question. Um, I'll start and share if you wanna add. Absolutely, the research shows that a lot of these chemicals, as that plant grows, you know, the amount of the chemical, one, some of it could be breaking down, but two, it'll be spread through a larger area. Um, there's a, a lot of, th every chemical acts differently. And so it's not easy to say exactly, but sh when you buy a plant and then you wait some time and it grows up, there's a likelihood that you're going to have lower and lower exposure amounts through time. So yes, that is helpful. In fact, one of the things that's recommended, granted, we would love fewer chemicals to be used so that both in production and after production, when you're buying that plant, there's less toxic residues on it. But barring that always being the case, giving yourself time for that plant to grow, for those chemicals to break down is always helpful to mitigate potential harm. There's a, there's a question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Matt. I just was giving everyone a minute if anyone else wanted to add. I, I was just going to mention there's an interesting question in the Q&A about monarchs laying eggs on plants treated with pesticides. And there is a paper about that. I'll paste the link to the paper in the chat. Uh, the answer is that they seem that they can tell if there are pesticides and they will lay fewer eggs on pesticide laden plants. Thank you, Matt. We have another question about a um, someone who has an organic native milkweed, I guess, farm, and um, they do give away a lot of their plants to the community, but they're wondering if there's a place they could go to test their plants for drift pesticides. You know, um, sorry to interrupt, Rachel. I realize there's some that we wanted to answer live that look like they're done, but they haven't been answered and they were early on, and I know we're getting tight on time. So I'm just gonna hop back to those real quick. Um, so have you reached out to nurseries IPM team? Communication between teams may help all parties come to a healthy resolution. And I can give you Pinelands Nursery IPM contact. We've been in contact with them um, and you, you might, may find his research beneficial. Sharon, I'm gonna let you answer this one live. Great question, thank you for asking it. Um, 
Well, on Pinelands, we're actually going to be, he just invited uh, Amay and I to talk on his podcast next week. So we'll be on that October 20th was the date that we're recording. I don't know when it will actually be posted, but we've known Tom at Pinelands for several years. Um, he was one of the first growers that we actually interviewed after I came on. Um, and we talked to nurseries quite a bit. And we, this will go to another question that came up is, do we have model growers? We have been looking for good examples of growers um, and talking to nurseries. And there are many very good growers out there. We'll never be able to find them all or talk to them all. But um, through our fact sheets, you'll see some good model practices. And we are also looking to through our website and through a video that we have in place to highlight um, some practices additional to what we've already highlighted in our fact sheets. Um, we're not so much highlighting um, the grower themselves necessarily as the practices that they are using. Um, just, you know, that we haven't really found a perfect grower, so to speak. I just want to give that caveat. A lot of times, uh, we find a lot of great practices and then maybe one practice that, that we don't think is so great, but we, so I just want to give that little caveat. Uh, in any case, we are looking to try to hold those up because we would like to um, inspire people and share that information and have nurseries themselves really be the teachers. Yeah, yeah, I think highlighting successes are the best way. And also, if you know that there's another grower that's successfully managing a particular pest or effectively without chemicals, you're more likely to want to try it yourself. You know, I, it's, there's a risk aversion for a lot of people, especially if it's their, if it's their job. Um, one other quick question before we move on was, and it's sort of more of a statement, but would love to discuss keeping lists of what similar systemic insecticides are going up uh, buy for trade names. That's how they're marketed to growers. Um, we often don't use trade names ourselves because there are all kinds of ramifications if we use a trade name. So we usually talk about the active ingredient, but there are a number of websites where you can look and look and see, oh, you know, what trade name goes with what active ingredient. And it's a huge challenge and issue for us. Um, the other thing that doesn't get to trade names, but when you're curious about similar systemic insecticides. I wanna point out that Sharon, working with a few other researchers, um, has pulled together an amazing list of systemic insecticides that you can uh, look to and maybe we can, I don't know if someone can find it and zip it into the chat for folks, but you can look and see what, how, what level of systemicity these chemicals have, what crops they're used on. And so anyway, when you're interested and wanna know what those systemic insecticides are. It's a great resource. All right, Rachel, sorry, we're moving down to the other ones before we wrap up. And Rachel's gonna have to leave just a little after 11. Um, we are possibly able to stay a few minutes over if we haven't answered all the questions. Where are we now with questions? My eyesight's terrible. Um, I'm not sure. I think because you've been popping around a little, I've lost track. Um, I just was at the top. I was at the top because it yeah. said um, I would answer live. So now anything else, we're good. Have you answered all the ones that you marked? Yes. Look at us. There's too many questions. You guys are amazing. You have great <laughs> questions. I will now mark them done. <laughs> okay. I just want did to make we, sure. did we cover Did we cover the impact on seeds? from plants that were treated? That question has been there a couple of times. No, thank you. Um, I don't think that, I have not come across research that gets to that level where like a plant was treated, maybe it was, maybe it was even like a soil drench and it got into the rhizome of that milkweed. It was uptaken by the plant. Maybe some of it's in that seed. I feel like with the background levels of pesticides we're dealing with, the levels of pesticides that are being applied until someone shows me that that seed from that plant is harmful, that's not where I'm going to focus my energy. I think if you've got a, a fresh seed and you want to put that in the ground, if that plant was treated um, compared to the kind of levels we were finding on the plants themselves, and maybe, I don't know, Sharon, do you have a more eloquent way of saying that or discussing, mentioning an answer? Um, no, I'll, I'll, I'll reiterate. There's 
actually not a lot of research. This question just came in from somebody this week. There's an old study, um, but it's pretty old and it didn't look at um, neonics, which we know are long lived. But I agree with MA that it's probably not where we would put our energy to worry about. Um, so, but again, data is kind of lacking. Um, It's really like a, a dilution question, right? Even if some of the, the pesticide gets into the seed, then when that seed grows and becomes a lot more biomass, the, the actual concentration of any chemical that came with it will be a lot lower. So we're actually right at noon um, and the panelists all agreed to stay a few minutes afterwards. And so we can keep trying to answer questions. Um, I think I got all the answers done. Now I'm going to hop to, um, are there recommended ecologically safe alternative pesticides that can be used in a greenhouse setting that will not create lasting residues on plant parts? Um, Sharon, do you want to start or do you want me to, or does someone else want to dive there? It's by Philippa Jones Johnstone. I can see. Um, are there recommended ecologically safe alternative pesticides? Oh, okay. Um, you know, this is a tough question to answer. Uh, we, we go back to sort of basic thinking about integrated pest management, which means that prevention should really be at the core of dealing with pest issues. And that if prevention is done well in combination with monitoring and scouting, and if pesticides then are used in a way that is very targeted, really carefully timed, et cetera, that that is the more ecologically safe way. We don't recommend pesticides partly because there's so many holes in pesticide regulation, there's holes in science. We don't always know. I mean, this demonstrated today that, wow, we've got some interesting effects from fungicides that we weren't really paying attention to for monarch butterflies. So science is always evolving. We hate to say, wow, you're safe using this pesticide or using that pesticide, even if data might show that, well, it doesn't seem to be killing anything. There might be these, um, what we call sublethal, you know, these, these effects that, that operate in a way that might decrease the individuals with populations ability to survive over the long run or to grow or to reproduce. So we, we don't recommend ecologically safe pesticides, but we do recommend those other practices, prevention, monitoring, limiting pesticide harm. And there are always, you know, relative toxicities depending on what um, what your endpoint is of concern, and there are organic products that can be shorter lived and lower toxicity. Um, but we also are not, you know, pest control advisors, and it's really hard because it's not like, oh, there's an ecologically sound, you know, um, silver bullet that we can apply depending no matter what the pest problem is. And it's so very pest specific, you know, and other issues. Um, but yeah, so. Sorry, we can't really answer that. That's a really tough one. I wish we did have silver bullets. We've got a ton more questions. Um, I don't even know where to start. I think we're, I feel like maybe what we should say is we can give you our emails again and, and hope, and maybe you can reach out to us and answer questions. Um, unless there's something here that Matt or Stephanie, Chris, one of you sees that you wanna make sure we answer live before we wrap up. There's one question about um, the effect of herbicides. Um, and I was just going to, we didn't find, and I was sp specifically asking about glyphosate, which we didn't find in either of the studies that we've done. So I didn't specifically look for it um, as far as, so the literature search we did is specific to the compounds we found. Um, so if that person wanted to reach out, I could do a more in-depth literature search than the one I've done for the past 30 seconds. Um, and Chris, it's okay. important, glyphosate was not one of the chemicals that was on our list. So we were limited to the suite of chemicals that could be tested. And there were clearly some pesticides that are used in nurseries that weren't actually in our suite of 92. 
So we don't know if glyphosate were on those plants. Granted, unlikely that any nursery was treating their plants with herbicides, but so most of the herbicides that we found were more likely some, you know, moved off, off target exposure because they wouldn't really have been wanting to treat um, those plants with herbicides very likely. Maybe they were outdoors and they were did a grass specific herbicide for a broadleaf plant. It's hard to say, but not that likely. But, but if one puts glyphosate toxicity insects into Google Scholar, there are some things that pop up. There's some interesting kind of indirect impacts and, you know, that have been looked at with honeybees and gut microbiomes. It's very, yeah, there's some interesting research out there on the impacts of glyphosate. Normally people think of herbicides being an indirect harm in that they would knock down plants that are forage, but we are seeing some direct effects. There's not a lot of research into it, but it is there.